This is Floss Weekly. I'm Doc Searles. This week, Jonathan Bennett and I talk with Steve Stroh, who is one of the world's great authorities on both open source and amateur, that's ham radio, um, which is the original form of open source, by the way. It is the, entirely open from the beginning. It's having a resurgence right now. And I took notes during this one, and I can't, I have the most notes I've ever taken during a show for this one because there was so much stuff discussed. So that is coming up next. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is Floss Weekly, episode 659, recorded Wednesday, December 8th, 2021. Open source and amateur radio. Hello again. Good morning, good evening, good whenever it is, wherever you are on earth. I am Doc Searles, and this is Floss Weekly, uh, this time joined by Jonathan Bennett himself, who will now appear for for those of you who have visual capacities, (laughs) which is a minority of you. Looking good, Jonathan. You're home in in, uh, Oklahoma. Oklahoma. (laughs) Yeah, in Oklahoma, where the wind comes rushing down the plank. We we had a day like that just the other day. I was afraid for my new fence. Anyway, yes, good to be here from the corporate headquarters, as I call it, the office. And I'm I'm still in another of the flyover states. (laughs) I'm in, in Bloomington, Indiana for... One of several more days, then I'm back in Santa Barbara, California. After that, so cool. so our, our our guest this time is Steve Stro, who we'll bring on shortly, and he is a ham, and we're going to talk ham stuff. And it's not on the same way as floss is not about um, dentistry. Uh, ham is not about agriculture. <laughs> um, so, but you are too, and and uh, we, we all, and I have been in the past. Mm-hmm. So are you active? Yeah. Are you very active? In- I am I am not active, not nearly as much as I want to be. Uh, there are a few things about ham radio that really, really intrigue me, namely packet networks and all of that. Um, mm-hmm. And, I, you know, I've got the somewhere around here, I've got the, one of those little Baofeng uh, handsets. Um, I've listened to the local chatter and, you know, done, done some things like that, but not, not as active as I'd like to be. Um, but I see, you know, I see lots of potential in ham radio. And then there's also a few things about it that really irritate me and kind of keep me from getting into it. And I'm hoping to (laughs) cover all of that with Steve today. (laughs) We will, we will touch on that. Um, and Steve has got me intrigued and, and interested again. I, um, especially if we can make it portable, I travel I, b- I bounce around so much and I tend to live in places where I have to go outdoors <laughs> you know, to, to do anything. Um, and I was very much into it as a, I hate to say like 60 years ago, I was, I, I just looked it up. I was, I was a novice ham 60 years ago. And Steve has pointed out that the FCC has no record of this. <laughs> you know, so that's another that's another thing. So it's it's kind of like I was in prehistory and and, and that and that doesn't matter anymore, I don't think. That's funny. Anyway, so so I I I, I wanna because we don't have uh, an opening ad today, I, I want to just get straight into it because I think we have an, an awful lot to talk about. Uh my, my guest today is Steve Stroh, who I've known for a long time, mostly as just an Ace wireless guy. I think Steve is, it's almost a cliche to say somebody has forgotten more about something than the rest of us will ever know. I think that's actually true about Steve. He's been, and most of the interaction I've had with him is on forum, fora, where uh, ham radio is not actually part of it. It's just wireless in general, anything that's not, anything that's RF, uh, Steve is a real authority on. And, um, but we're going to talk about about uh, ham radio today and and uh, and how how it works with open source. So so welcome aboard, Steve. You're in <laughs> there. He is, and you're in the great Northwest somewhere, right? I'm in Bellingham, Washington, which is beloved by a lot of Linux folks because of our Linux Fest Northwest held every April until COVID hit. And uh, I've met a few notables in the Linux world, um, such as Mad Dog Hall and Bidel Garby coming to Bellingham just to participate at Linux Fest. Yeah, and and also um, a Linux journal, for which I was an editor with for almost all of its history. And I was involved with from before its history. It was going to be the free software magazine before it became Linux, uh, Linux journal. And um, 
it was close to Phil, uh, Phil, uh, Phil Hughes, who started it in, uh, in Seattle, in particular, in Ballard. In fact, we occupied the Ballard building for a while. Did you know, Phil, you wrote a bit for Linux Journal, I know, in those I, early I wrote a days. Tiny in fact, the bit. first issue, yeah. Go ahead. I, I, I had met Phil at some amateur radio gathering, but I didn't know who he was in the Linux world at the time. Yeah, so. Phil, Phil, Phil wore geek camouflage, meaning that, you know, he was bald and had a Santa Claus beard. And <laughs> so he kind of blended in with everybody else. But um, but he wanted, um, he wanted, I think he wanted Linux Journal to be a bit more about ham radio than it ended up being. And so, so maybe if if you could give us kind of the long view on not only where ham radio was and stands today and the big difference between those two, but where it fits in the open source world. Well, amateur radio was one of the very first implementations of open source because we shared knowledge so widely. Of course, back then it was on paper, but um, there were very few secrets or proprietary technology, you know, up until probably the 90s. Um, radios were made with standard components. Uh, the manufacturers published schematics openly. Um, they made the parts available and, and they didn't use proprietary parts or, or very specialized parts. And, you know, back in the tube era, that was just about impossible. So fast forward to today, there, there was ham radio didn't change a lot other than the introduction of transistors instead of tubes until mid-1980s when there was a very severe step change, packet radio entered the scene because of the invention of microprocessors. And you can think of packet radio to amateur radio as what modems were to computers. Um, you had a little box that served basically the same function as a modem in between the uh, computer and the radio and I'll get into why that's changed in a second. Um, there was a little, had to be a little bit more intelligence in the TNC, as we called it then, terminal node controller, than um, there was in a modem because you had to also add a networking intelligence into the TNC to sort out the signals that were going out over the air. So fast forward from the 1980s when we had the initial packet radio to now, is that the embarrassment is that we have an incredible rich set of tools, including so open source software and open source hardware. The Raspberry Pi has just really transformed amateur radio. Uh, but we don't have packet radio networks nearly to the extent that we used to because we have the internet and mobile phones. So it's, I, there's so many things I'd love to talk about, but it, I'll uh, I'll let the how it goes be guided by you two. <laughs> hey Steve, I, so I mentioned I've got some annoyances about ham radio at the top of the show, and uh, you're you're getting real close to one of them. So let's talk about this about packet radio and the thing that I feel is holding ham and packet radio particularly back is the FCC's rules that essentially outlaw encryption on ham networks. And you compare that with the state of the internet today where we're pushing to get every packet encrypted. And there's just a disconnect there. It makes it difficult even to use things like SSH over ham radio, uh, over a packet network. Uh, and I'm curious if you have any thoughts on that. Um, there are definitely reasons for pro and con for that ban. Basically, it was, it was an attempt to keep amateur radio amateur. They don't want people using amateur radio in a way that lends itself to being commercialized. Um, so it's, it's, if you can hide what's, what you're, what's being transmitted uh, in encryption, then there's nothing to stop a taxi company from saying, you know, starting to make use of it. Not that they would, they've got cellular now, but you're right. There, there are, and it really gets in the way with emergency communications because there are an awful lot of emergency communications served agencies like hospitals, et cetera, that really want their data to be encrypted, not exposed over the air. Required by law. They're required yes. by law to have their data encrypted. Yes. 
Yeah. So we, so one of the ways we're getting around that is where, is that hams are, when they're building networks, they're in a lot of times uh, using part 15 equipment, um, microwave equipment that on the license exempt bands, like 2.4 gigahertz and 5.8 gigahertz that aren't am anything to do with amateur radio. So they, you know, the encryption can be used. So, so that's, I, that's essentially... I, I hear you and I agree with yeah, you. Yeah, sorry, go ahead. So that's that's essentially like uh, the the LoRa equipment. Uh, L O R A stands for long range, right? That's that's kind of the the workaround now. It, it is kind of, but the trouble is, is that LoRa when you there's two main bands for LoRa, and that's uh, four thirty three megahertz and eight sixty eight megahertz. The eight sixty eight can't be used in the U S. because that's a cellular band, but turns out four thirty three is also an amateur band. So there's no such thing as, you know, using LoRa technically, you know, um, unlicensed in the U.S., at least at the power levels that most LoRa equipment is operating on. So that's a gray area that has to be <laughs> settled once at some point. But nobody, no, they're not making enough noise to make it worth making a fuss yeah, about it yet. That seems to be the kicker for a lot of those new technologies. You know, you, you, you can push up to, you know, this much power, this much wattage on your transmissions without having your, your amateur license. But if you try to go above that, well, you've got to have some way to, to, to tag your call sign on there to make it legal. And yeah, that is, that's kind of a headache for everybody, isn't it? Yeah. Well, as I hope we'll talk about later, it's amateur radio is literally a license to experiment. So one of the things that's happening is, that the because we're you we're pushing radio into the software realm increasingly so, you know, essentially what we used to have to do in hardware we can now do in software and one of the things that we're doing very well in software is increasing the ability to receive a very very weak signal so we don't have you know so in where in the old days, you used to, if you wanted a better signal being received, you had to up your power. Now you just throw more compute power at it, and you get you've got greater range and greater reliability. You talk about moving hardware into software. I am sure you're familiar what with what uh, this little device is uh, a TV tuner that uh, some hackers finally discovered that no, there's actually a software defined radio chip in there, and this really kind of blew the doors off a lot of experimentation that uh, is at least adjacent to ham radio. Uh, before we go any further, you want <clears throat> to just comment on uh, SDR and, and the state of it? Uh, very, very active field. Um, we're, we're making it simpler than ever. One, one of my favorite projects that I linked to when in the, discuss, the earlier discussion prior to the show was a project called RPI-TX. And... The Raspberry Pi has such a powerful processor and it can modulate its GPIO pins fast enough that it actually, if you if you modulate one particular pin, I don't remember which one it is, it can become a radio transmitter and with the right software. So yeah, perfect. Um, so basically you throw this software onto a Raspberry Pi, hook an antenna up to that GPIO pin, and you then have a software-defined transmitter. And then you go back to um, your little um, software-defined receiver dongle. You've got the other half of the what, and, and you then have a radio. You have a, for the cost of thirty-five dollars on each end, on, on each side, and plus the software-defined receiver. So that's 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 what passes as a radio. This is another one. So just for visual effect. This is an amateur rate. Oh boy! Yeah, <laughs> hey, hey, for those of you that watch, Zoom needs to think it's part of your body. It needs to think it's part of your body, so you have to hold it in front of yourself. <laughs> okay. It's crazy. There we go. Yeah. So this is this is an amateur radio. This is happens to be a digital mobile radio, uh, portable radio. But most people won't recognize this as an amateur radio. But it is. Yeah. For, for, for those not watching uh, or able to watch, it looks like, it just looks like a USB stick, but it's yep. not. It radiates. It's actually a Wi-Fi router 
that can be reprogrammed to operate on 2.3 gigahertz, which in the U.S., or which uh, the upper portion of which is exclusive to amateur radio. So that becomes an amateur radio device. Um, and um, <laughs> we, we, we can just do so many things these days in AM radio. And the folks that are um, that think that it's uh, just old white guys sitting in the basement tapping on a Morse code key is <laughs> way, way out of date. <laughs> Although to be clear, the way, there I, are I, still I, some I, of us old white guys tapping on Morse code I, keys. I, know, I actually qualify. <laughs> For those of you looking, this is a basement that I'm in. I'm an old white guy. And... And I, you know, I, I, I still know Morse code. You know, my my old call sign was da 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 yeah. So there's there's plenty of us that are that have a little bit of nostalgia, but we rather we much prefer looking forward to what's going on and you know that's aligned closely with the technology <laughs> fields. For example, we're we're building there's an awful lot of ham organizations that are building their own microwave networks now, just somewhat because of you know, to have emergency communications capability that doesn't rely on the internet or commercial communications, mm -hmm. uh, but also to to learn because one of the things I've seen is that people are getting their amateur radio licenses specifically because they can start building microwave networks and learn about things instead of just having to do the Wi-Fi on the campus and things like that. So they're getting their amateur radio license so they can experiment technologically. You know, let, it, let me ask you a question. It, it, it just, if you don't mind, my, it's sort of interrupting the flow for a minute because um, my, you know, like I, I have a an almost profound understanding of of very long waves, <laughs> right? You know how they bounce off the ionosphere. I can look at a tower. I can look at a ham radio rig on somebody's tower attic and i generally know what that is and what it's going to do um where my knowledge of what happens at 2.x and 5 and and other you know gigahertz frequencies is largely limited to what we get from cellular and 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 wi-fi and my automatic understanding of that is it's very short range by nature um does not want to go very far. It's not is used in a cellular way, meaning that it wants to be local. It doesn't want to be, doesn't want to go long dis, distance. And so I am almost completely ignorant of what could be done here in the ham stuff. I'm learning even as we're talking right now. Um, so, so fill us in for, or fill me in for a second on what, what, I mean, I, obviously the inverse square law still applies, but the, I, I know the ability of a radio now to, especially for a software-defined radio, an SDR. I know what that is for those who haven't picked up on that. We were talking about SDRs earlier. Um, uh, they're so much more sensitive and able to make so much more sense out of a signal than than an old-fashioned tube or even a transistor radio could in, in days of yore, So, which effectively increases range and capacity, especially data handling capacity. But beyond that, I don't know enough. So can you give me a kind of a, a capsule description of what's possible up there? what the openings are well the um microwave frequencies is you which is basically anything above one gigahertz um they can go for 30 miles limited only by the curvature of the earth because they travel in a straight line and depending on what you're talking about um for power so for example the part 15 frequencies are widely used for um Wireless internet service providers, they provide service in a local area off of a tower. And the taller the tower, the greater the range. And they tend to, the user equipment tends to have a, a focused beam pointing back at the tower to get maximum signal throughput. And the same thing that we're talking about with software-defined radios, they're 
There's some software defined radio in these part 15 devices, but largely they are benefiting from the incredible compute power that they can do redundant passes at trying to decode a signal. And just because of the greater compute power, they can get greater range and higher speeds. The other thing is being that's helping with higher speeds is wider channels these days, 20 and 40 megahertz is uh, very common to up the speeds. So the, your part 15 devices, like your Wi-Fi router, they're designed to be low power and very localized, but they don't have to be. If you take that same Wi-Fi router and stick it on top of a 40 foot tower, the range would be much, much greater. And what actually a lot of wireless ISPs started by taking part 15 gear, diving into it, modifying it, attaching an antenna connector, and then putting an antenna at the top of a tower with a long piece of feed line. That was a, kind of a stupid way to do it, but they did it. <laughs> and hams are, hams are endlessly inventive. So doc, for example, um, there are hams have a portion of the 2.4, just below the 2.4 gigahertz band that they are using to access a geosynchronous satellite in uh, the Eastern hemisphere. Um, there's one wow. that's parked right above Africa and they're doing it. Their hands are transmitting 22,300 miles up and receiving a downlink signal back. And they're yeah. using power amplifiers that put out typically 20 watts at 2.4 gigahertz. So it's not the frequency that's the limitation as much as antennas, uh, height, um, directivity, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you're right that they do have to, it has to fly in a straight line and they tolerate very little interference in that line of sight. Like a, a big, a big enough tree will definitely take out a signal, especially the higher you go. Um, but if you can, if you have a direct line of sight to a transmitter, your range is limited to maybe 50 miles. So, so, uh, I, I'll go ahead and jump in. And, uh, you know, you're, you're talking about the line of sight. One of the coolest stories I've ever heard about ham radio, I thought, uh, one of the guys doing the class where I got my license was telling about when they were doing uh, a competition to see how far away they could talk to someone. Um, they were actually, instead of trying to transmit horizontally, they were transmitting up, pointing at the moon. And his explanation was, we can actually bounce our signal off of the moon and get it to someone, you know, a quarter of the way around the world. And I just thought that was the the coolest and most inventive thing I have ever heard. And I'm sure there are all sorts of those kind of stories bound up with ham radio, aren't there? Yep. But that's another favorite topic of mine is it's, it's called moon bounce or earth, moon, earth, EME. And so we, when, I got started in ham radio. A friend of mine took me out to a friend's farm. He wanted to show me his antenna. And this guy was a farmer and he was handy with a welding rig and he had fabricated his own EME array and he fed it with uh, a kilowatt amplifier. You'll that, that probably starts to perk up uh, Doc's interest in <laughs> yeah. starting to go into the kilowatts. So amateur radio operators are legally licensed, at least in the U S to run up to one kilowatt 1000 watts of power so the way that we would do earth moon earth in the olden days is we threw a hell of a lot of power at it into a big array of antennas to get maximum signal delivered to the moon and then you had to have a very sensitive receiver and a very directional antenna to receive that and that was the province of a very very few people you know we're talking probably of in the low hundreds around the world out of the hundreds of thousands of hams. But then we got computers and a interesting guy named Joe Taylor, K1JT, uh, who happens to, his day job was um, radio astronomy. And he actually got a Nobel prize for his work on quasars. He retired from Princeton and had some time on his hands and had a fair amount of digital signal processing expertise. And he whipped up a piece of software he called WSJT, Weak Signal Joe Taylor. And basically, it does a, a lot of forward error correction in the signal being transmitted. So lots of redundant data. 
And then the best part was it is, again, talking about these, these digital signal processing techniques. Um, he, it, it listens very carefully and, and runs multiple passes of the received signal through a powerful computer, which these days we all have. Um, and then with that, you can run a very modest station um, easily 100, 100 watts is more than enough to do EME. So with a directional beam antenna pointed at the moon, 100 watt transmitter and WSJT, you too can now do EME. It's, it's basically within the range of any reasonably equipped ham um, to, do, to do this. And now he's branched out this WSJT software into many other different things like meteor scatter. So most people don't realize that the Earth is continually getting bombarded with meteors, but they all burn up in the atmosphere. But as they're burning up, they leave these, these trails, um, and you can actually get signals off of them So if you're fast enough. So WSJT has another mode for meteor scatter. And then there's all kinds of experimentation you can do. My favorite one is called WISPR, Weak Signal Propagation Reporter, WSPR. And um, you can go check that out at WISPRNET, W-S-P-R-N-E-T, I think, dot com, I believe. It. Um, and what that is, is that very, very low power signals in the HF range, which is below 30 megahertz, um, can be picked up around the world with very modest antennas, very, very low transmitters. If you pop the map up, it kind of jumps the, let's see, the map in the upper right corner link. Yeah, there you go. So these are all stations that are transmitting and being heard around the world. So, and these are typically dedicated stations that, you know, you, you buy a very simple radio um, and leave it on all the time. And the way that Whisper works is it has a common time base and then it kind of coordinates who's going to transmit so it can be heard all around the world. And it's the the ranges are just astonishing. These these are you know you you look at a little Raspberry Pi with a little add-on board that's connected to an antenna, and you wouldn't imagine that this thing could go be heard literally around the world, but it can because of software digital signal processing, and we have compute power to burn now. Again, you know we we computing the amount of compute power that we have has just absolutely transformed amateur radio. Um, we can do things that we never could have done before now that we've got fast computers well we have still a very long list of things we need to get into and uh, and our own debugging of our own internal system in a moment but i first have to let you know that about club twit um joining club twit is another great way to support our network here uh, as a member you'll get access to ad free versions of all the shows on twit and other great benefits, there's a bonus Twit Plus feed, which includes footage and discussions uh, that don't make the final show edit, as well as bonus shows that we've started, such as the Untitled Linux Show, hosted by Jonathan Bennett himself on the show on this show today. Uh, the 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 Giz Fizz and other monthly members only content. There's a community aspect. Uh, we have a really fun Discord server that's available only to Club Twit members. There you can chat with other members about the shows and many other various tech topics and other non-tech topics. There's even a beer and cocktails chat on our Discord. Um, so sign up to Club Twit for the cost of one fancy cup of coffee per month. That's just $7 a month gets you into the club. Head over to twit.tv slash club twit. That's twit.tv slash club twit and join today. So, Steve, we've talked a lot about the experimentation and the technical details of ham, and I'm sure we'll ask more about that in a minute. But I want to cover, maybe for the sake of our, our listeners, the uh, disaster recovery and emergency response sides of ham. Uh, I've got uh, a couple of friends that have been involved in the Civil Air Patrol, uh, CAP as they call it, and those guys do a lot with ham uh, for those sorts of things, and that even National Guard, State Guard, um, and and even here in Oklahoma, particularly when there are tornadoes come through, like, for example, a couple of times up in Moore, just devastating. And one of the things that will normally happen with those is a lot of communications will get knocked out. And there's stories that gets told about 
guys that are hams setting up little stations, uh, you know, going out into the field and getting messages sent back and forth. So when the cell phone networks are down and the landlines are down, people can know, oh, this person that I care about, yeah, they're okay, they made it. And uh, I think that's just a super important part of the ham community. And I wonder if you take a minute and just kind of talk about that and your experiences with, with disaster recoveries as ham goes. Uh, it's it was one of the essential missions of amateur radio when it was created, um, and still to this day, it's uh, probably fifty percent of in my experience of uh, people in amateur radio are active or have gotten into ham radio specifically to do that. Um, it has a bit of a checkered history. Um, for example, here in Western Washington, the Red Cross just fired all the hams because they didn't think they needed them anymore. Uh, but it turned out that they thought that radio was still plug and play. And what the hams brought besides their ability to communicate was all the technical expertise. And so they're trying to fix that. Um, so there's several different things that I'm interested in in amateur radio. The, one of them is that we have a system called WinLink that is essentially radio-based email. And the idea is that there's a particular, uh, what's the philosophy called the edge of the disaster um, theory is that disasters tend to be localized, either, either very localized or regionally, like a, a tornado, uh, as, for your example. Um, the tornadoes don't hit everywhere. so. You've got communications, and then suddenly you don't. So if you can bridge between the places that you don't and the places that do and let the um, normal communication systems take over, um, that's what WinLink is. So you set up, you can, you can show up with what hams call a go kit, which is a radio, a battery, a computer, um, a portable antenna, and set up uh, on a picnic, something as rustic as a picnic table and get the get things out and start communicating. People walk up to you and say, I wanna send a message to X and you type it in, you send, you know what the person's email address is and it goes out over radio to, and then hits a, what's called a WinLink remote mail server. And then from at that point, it starts, it's forwarded into the internet to be delivered as normal email. And it comes from a, an address that's winlink.org. And as far as I'm concerned, every ham ought to be able to do this. Um, you know, you, you should learn how to do this because it's an incredible capability. And it doesn't take a lot of equipment. And a lot of the hams in my area now have built their um, go kits around a Raspberry Pi computer because it's very small. It's, you know, very power efficient instead of a laptop. So um, there's that. Uh, we and the other, and you can also do WinLink um, with HF radio going much further than what you can do in VHF and UHF. So, um, and WinLink actually works, um, at, you can use it on a boat, you can use it, you know, remotely um, when you're RVing, things like that. Uh, that's, and then of course, we, we do, we still do good old fashioned voice <laughs> with our handheld radios you know um we have hams have what are called repeaters well there's lots of radio organizations that use repeaters but hams have probably deployed more repeaters than anyone else um yeah there, there's it's a joke that uh, there's a ratio of two repeaters for every ham and that's obviously an exaggeration but it's, it's <laughs> we, we get a lot we put up a lot of repeaters for various purposes and various communities um, so with this little handheld radio, um, I can hit a repeater that is many miles from me because it's on a high point. It's got a very sensitive receiver. It's got a very powerful transmitter and I can leverage that. The joke, when I would go to the, um, Dayton Hamvention, um, when I got to Dayton, uh, from, uh, my home, you could actually listen to the two meter repeater that was on top of what was then called the Sears building, you know, and that was more than 150 miles away because, you know, it's so high and, you know, powerful transmitter. 
So we have a lot of different capabilities depending on what's needed. And now, now these microwave networks are also coming into play. The, there's a microwave network here in Washington, Western Washington, that stretches from the Washington border to the south all the way up north to the Canadian border. Um, and it's one of the, and one of the things that we discovered kind of accidentally was that it was immune to the kind of telecommunications outages that commercial networks are. For example, the state of Washington uses has its own microwave network, but uh, there are parts of it that were routed over CenturyLink. And when CenturyLink would have problems, all of a sudden their normal network and their emergency network would go down because they couldn't route any packets. But this, this microwave network stayed up because it was a totally microwave network um, other than the internet connectivity that's incidental to it. Um, it, was, it had all its own infrastructure. Um, and even when one of these towers drops offline, if, if you lose the links to it, it's still self-sufficient. The thing, a lot of what ham radio is all about is kind of a, a mindset about once you understand the radio technology and what's behind it, all of a sudden you understand a lot of things that people don't normally think about, like how actually fragile the cellular system is. Mm -hmm. And, you know, how do you, you know, antennas get blown off a tower and how do you put up an antenna? How do you make an antenna? Literally a ham with a little bit of technical background can take a piece of coax, measure it out and strip it back. And all of a sudden you have an antenna and civilians think antennas are things that you buy Hands think of antennas as things you can make. You, you so, talked about re, you talked about repeaters, and uh, there's a there's an open source project that I have to plug here because I really enjoy it. Uh, Chirp, C H I R P. Uh, I'm sure it stands for something. I don't know what it is off the top of my head. It is it is essentially it's two things. It is a database of repeaters from around the world, and then it is also software to let you program your portable radio with those uh with those repeaters and uh you know you can you can get the little adapter and use it with the cheap 35 dollar balfangs and it makes those things a whole lot more useful and then you mentioned repeaters the other thing that comes to mind and I, they do it here from time to time is when you link repeaters and i know sometimes this is done with you know, another ham signal from, from repeater to repeater. In other places, it's actually a link over the internet, which you were just talking about. Um, but I think that's just the, the neatest thing that you can jump on a repeater here and talk to someone that maybe hundreds of miles away. Uh, it, it, it's such a cool technology and something to get into. Yeah, one of the things that's cool about us in Western Washington is because we have this amateur radio microwave network, a lot of the repeater to repeater linking is actually done over this network. So, you know, there's the repeater linking doesn't depend on the internet in a lot of cases. In fact, uh, the other group that I'm involved with that provides grants to amateur radio uh, has funded like three microwave networks this past year. One of them in Colorado, that, that it needs to be rebuilt because amateur radio lost a chunk of spectrum at 3.5 gigahertz. And they had to bring those radios down off the mountains. Yep, that's the one. So I, I saw in your list of, of uh, topics that you are interested in something that I've been following as well. And uh, maybe we can pivot to that and talk about it for a minute. And that's the Caribou Light uh, Raspberry Pi hat. And this is, uh, it's actually for the, uh, the, the Pi Zero, the real small Raspberry Pi. And it's a tiny little hat that sits on top of it. And a, a hat, by the way, is a hardware attached on top. <laughs> it, it's, it's Raspberry Pi's fun little, uh, little pun there. Um, but this gives you a, a uh, receive and transmit SDR that you can run off your Raspberry Pi. And I think this is just, you know, we've talked about how computers have blown open ham radio. I think this is going to uh, to really make some changes as far as super portable ham radio uh, because there's all kinds of things you can do with with this sort of a system. Uh, you want to you talk about the Caribou Light? Sure. Um, it's just the latest example of a long line of software-defined transceivers. 
Um, and this particular one is open source. Uh, kudos to them. Um, it's actually running a crowdfunding campaign to actually make them now. Um, and they did a good job. And I actually exchanged a couple of um, tweets back and forth between the team. And I said, I was skeptical that you could do software-defined transceivers with a Raspberry Pi Zero, given that it has limited RAM and limited CPU power. And well, at least it did until they came out with the Raspberry Pi Zero Two W. I think is the, the I think correct that's what they phrase. It, yeah, yeah. That now we have a quad. Now you've now for twenty dollars you have a quad core, you know, processor. <laughs> <laughs> it just blows me away. So they said, no problem. They said no problem. The the Zero has plenty of CPU horsepower to do the mission. And I'm looking forward to it. In fact, I, I got to get on the crowdfunding before all the goodies are gone. Yeah, same here. I'm, I'm interested to see, and this is something we've, we've actually had an interview on Floss Weekly with a, with a group trying to do this, uh, Faraday RF. And that project has kind of dried up and gone away. Uh, but they were trying to do something similar. And it was the idea of building a mesh network out of real small ham radios. And I find that very fascinating for the idea of, you know, you have multiple nodes around a city and maybe multiple cities. And so again, you know, this scenario, a a very possible scenario of other communications going down, you've got a group of people that can communicate back and forth. And uh, I would, I would love to see uh, caribou light turn into something like uh, something like that. Maybe, uh, maybe tap into some of the old uh, bulletin board system vibes from days gone by. Yep. So this is this is what you're talking about. This is this is a mesh a node on a mesh network. If I plug this into my uh, PC and fired it up, I could be meshing with the other mesh network radios in my shop here behind you know behind that wall. Um, and the the project called Arden A R E D N, and if you want to bring up a web page, it's ardenmesh.org A R D A-R-E-D-N mesh.org. Um, that is a mesh networking that not only is adds mesh networking to little part 15 devices like this, it also um, retunes those radios into the ham only bands um, where we can run narrower channels and, and um, have, have much greater range. There you go. Based on so, WRT, um, I see. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Uh, so, a project near and dear to my heart. <laughs> yeah. So this is so this is the other microwave network technology that's t- really taking off. Uh, Southern California has a, a lot of these, and it is a amateur radio mesh network at reasonable speeds, five megabits per second, it's typical. Um, that is used for many things, including voice over IP. You know, we you can run. Uh, Oh, what is, I can't remember the voice over IP uh, open source implementation. I'll, it'll come to me right after we get off there. Uh, uh, asterisk. asterisk. Yeah, yes, you can, you can run an asterisk server on a Raspberry Pi. And there's lots of folks that, uh, amateurs who now have voice over IP phones sitting on their desk that are linked back via microwave. And they call yes. it the bat phone. And so... Um, <laughs> Yeah, the, there's just an endless number of things, and and that's, that's all these different things that are interesting to me are weren't being reflected in the uh, the mainstream amateur radio press, uh, and so I started a newsletter to just talk exclusively about that stuff. And one of the things that really chaps me about speaking of you know open source and public access is that. The amateur radio organizations, such as the American Radio Relay League or ARRL, and even the magazine CQ, they all, you know, they hide all of their content behind a paywall. And mm. somebody who's curious about amateur radio and just not sure what it's all about can never see that stuff. And for and in the case of the ARRL, even if you're starting out, you're a starving student, you've got to pay fifty dollars a year just to be able to see their interesting content and it's and for a techie it's not all that interesting most of the time so that's why i started my newsletter and it's free to access no and 
you know, anybody can join and subscribe and <laughs> hear my ramblings every week <laughs> about what I found interesting. Uh, okay. I, I need to get on your mailing list. Um, this is not the right time of the show to do it quite, but where, go ahead, go ahead and plug it. Where do we go to get on your mailing list? Uh, zero retries, Z E R O retries, R E T R I E S dot substack dot com. Yes, I'm one of those substackers. There we go. There you go. Um, you know, we talked about link. Awesome. Uh, We talked about mesh networking, and somebody introduced me to to something, and I I just real quick want to get your thoughts on it. Uh, Are you familiar with Helium? Uh, so for those playing blockchain bingo at home, here, here's your, your blockchain square. You can color it in. Uh, Helium is, I don't think it's actually on the ham network, um, but it, it's, uh, it's supposed to be, I think, like a device tracker, and, but it has a cryptocurrency built into it. Have you, have you heard of Helium at all? And I'm curious what you think about it. I've heard of it, and it is not on amateur radio. And some, some people have made the mistake of, putting it on amateur radio systems or frequencies and it, it quickly gets <laughs> that quickly gets discouraged. Um, that's, that's another thing about amateur radio is that we have a very good system of self policing. Um, it's, it's not foolproof as anyone in Southern California can attest, but uh, we, g- we generally, you know, keep track of what's going on. And that's another reason, Jonathan, for not having encryption because of things exactly like that, that, you know, it just can re- lead to rampant abuse. So Helium is a, is a, is a project and there's enough part 15 equipment out there to form meshes. And it's, I think it's using mostly LoRa on probably on 433 megahertz or, or maybe 902 to 928 megahertz. Um, I, I, people have come up to me about it. I haven't studied it extensively, so I can't comment very intelligently about it other than, yeah, it's a mesh network with, some, like you said, some cryptocurrency <laughs> built in, some some cryptocurrency good, goodness, you know, to rub off. Uh, well, it's 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 ham network adjacent. It's, I'm sure, interesting to some of the same people that find ham interesting. Um, so, and people that know me and, and listen to me on floss knows there's one more subject that I feel like I have to get in on almost every show. Uh, do you think, and I know you're, we talked about this a little before the show, Starlink is something that's real, real fascinating to you. Uh, and and I guess the way I'm going to intro this, do you think Starlink is going to steal some of the thunder from ham radio because it it solves some of the same problems, uh, maybe better, maybe worse. Uh, what do you, what do you think about that? You're absolutely right, and and it, and, you, and it absolutely will, when especially when they get the mobility portion in. But it's good enough now. Yeah. So, for yeah. example, when a community's communications gets wiped out, you know, uh, even a fiber cut, you can you know, uh, helicopter in a you know a bunch of kits uh, that that fit in a large suitcase, um, and then just set up a terminal point it up and it figures out how to get in communication here and you're online with the internet at 100 megabits a second so you know it's, that's basically what people want these days they they want to be on the internet to be able to do voice over ip um to check facebook <laughs> et cetera, et cetera. and that takes you know that that ability to do fast um repair or, or replacement is what a lot of people are going to need now. Um, in fact, it's, it's, it, there, you're going to see a huge change in the ability to repair cellular because right now all these cells on wheels have to use geosynchronous satellites. When you see these cells on wheels, they put up the big dish antenna and, go, rah, 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 and it <laughs> aims at a particular satellite. And, but being 22,300 miles away, there's an appreciable lag. So there's a lot of um, latency in for voice and Zoom, et cetera, which just isn't present on Starlink. So you're, you're absolutely right. And I, I'm equally fanatic about Starlink as, uh, as I am about ham radio, as Doc can attest after watching my rambles on our other community. <laughs> so there, there was I, I've, a, I've, uh, written, I've actually written a fair amount about it on my blog. If you go to... Uh, um, Jonathan, if you want to go to bwianews.com, you'll find it. That's my that's my wireless blog, bwianews.com. Got it. 
So there was a, a, a bit of an unconfirmed rumor, but I, I actually I believe it was probably accurate, um, that apparently when uh, <clears throat> uh, the kerfluffle in Afghanistan, and I'm, I don't want to get political here at all, but uh, when there was an issue trying to get people out of Afghanistan back a couple of months ago, <clears throat> um, there was a user on Reddit that started asking questions, and uh, it appears that the Department of Defense actually called up Starlink and dropped multiple Starlink receivers at their various sites in Afghanistan to keep comms up. And, uh, you know, of course, I, I've not gotten that on the record or there'd be a Hackaday article about it already. Um, but it's it's just it's an interesting little rumor that those things are already happening. There are people paying attention that kind of understand how useful this could be. Uh, yeah, and it's not even as good as it's going to get right now. The all of the Starlink satellites are operating in what's called bent pipe mode, meaning that for you to get communications via Starlink, there has to be a ground terminal and the user in the footprint mm -hmm. of the same satellite. But start, it's, it's definitely on the design, uh, or it's in the plan that the Starlink satellites will all be networked together in orbit using lasers. And once that happens, it's a total game changer. By the way, that's how the Iridium satellite system works now. And Iridium only has a handful of ground stations around the world, but it handles, you know, hundreds of thousands of customers, and, you know, on every place in the world. It was the, the Iridium system was kind of a prototype for um, what Starlink is doing now at scale. Sorry, Jonathan, I, <laughs> you and I could have many yeah, conversations I, about Starlink. I, I you guys, yes, I think so. I think Doc wants to jump back in. Could. It's about time to there, wrap, there, there, it? there are a couple of things. One is, you know, I have, I have friends and acquaintances in the astronomy business, the degree that is a business, who hate Starlink <laughs> because it, it leaves streaks in the sky uh, that, you know, there's the, it's part of the noise that's up there. And it's one of the, I think it's one of the, uh, compromises we make, uh, you know, to, to have civilization. Um, a, a question I have, and it, and it may be an unanswerable one or maybe a naive one, which is if, if you were to do a pie chart of what is ham activity now, I mean, you know, Jonathan mentioned, um, you know, emergency stuff, the pure hobby stuff, the, is, is it possible to make one or is it too hard to characterize or even survey? What, I mean, if you were to break it out into categories, what are those? Uh, technical experimentation is uh, a small slice, maybe 15%. Hmm. Uh, purely recreational operations, which is contesting and trying to work stations that are distant from you. There's a... Um, that's probably easily 25%. Emergency communications is easily another 25%. Um, gee, what else? Technical experimentation. Sorry, I'm drawing yeah, a blank. I, I, I am not representative of the average amateur radio. Yeah, well, it, I don't think anybody's ever fully representative of anything um, because human beings are complicated and weird. Um, you were mentioning well, earlier that Ham's like, go ahead, sir, go ahead. There's the canonical joke that if you get uh, two hams in a room discussion, you'll get three different opinions, you know, so. <laughs> <laughs> I, I could probably come up with three on my own, um, yeah. which is one former ham. <laughs> um, but, but, I, but I, you know, I loved making antennas back when they were big, <laughs> you know, <laughs> an 80 meter antenna, which is, you know, a, a dipole, a hundred and some feet long that went to the neighbor's tree in the back and, um, you know, but but I was thinking, and, and, and actually with our new TV upstairs, there's only one TV station within a few miles, within 20 miles of here. So I, I just took a, a twist tie and stuck it in the center hole of the coax hole and it works fine, right? That gets the TV station. <laughs> the TV station is also one megawatt, you know, so it's not, it, yeah. it tends to work. For, that's what they tend to be on on. on on the, the UHF band, they've carved off the whole top of the UHF TV band and given it over to other purposes, um, mostly cellular, I guess. But, but, but I'm wondering, I mean, for, for stuff in the 
2.45 and up. How those wavelengths are really small. What do you, what do you is it what fancy do you do? I can't imagine a tiny itty bitty Yagi antenna I, or a log periodic antenna, which are the two kinds that I made back in the 60 years ago on, on a metal or wooden frame. What what do those look like? I mean, I, I, I don't even know. There's one in my phone, but I don't know what that looks like. They can look like uh, panel antennas, you know, flat panel antennas. They can yeah. look like uh-huh. a, a a normal UHF VHF because it's multiple wavelengths of this of that frequency. Um, they're they're all very doc. And doc, what's uh, cool about you know the current technologies is we have so much better test equipment now than we used to because of computers. We have uh, these what's are called. Uh, analyzers that you can that it now fit in the palm of your hand and you can you can design an antenna just throw something together and see how it performs over an entire range of frequencies um, and you know and, and actually one of the stated goals for using whispernet the weak signal propagation reporter is to do exactly what you're talking about try it try an antenna build it build a different kind of antenna and then um, Try it out and see how it performs, um, and you know how well it gets out all over the whole world. There's this new, whole new different uh, form of antennas. Um, the name escapes me again. Uh, oh, mag- magnetic loop antennas. It's basically just a big loop of coax that's carefully tuned, uh, you know, carefully measured, carefully tuned. And it's astonishing how well it gets out. Um, you can sit it on a balcony of an apartment, and it's and it works great. You know, you can work contacts around the world, especially on these digital modes now that are very patient. So yeah, so well, the antenna antenna experimentation is <laughs> one of those things that people love to do in, in ham radio. And it goes back to my theme that getting an amateur radio license is literally, very literally, <laughs> a license to experiment with radio technology. Well, there's there's so much more to talk about. I, um, uh, but I and I'm thinking of some things, and I'm also looking at the clock. And uh, I have an actual clock. It's not digital. It's actually, <laughs> but it's a radio in it because it's listening to WWVH or whatever it is. And I, I, WWVB, WWVB. You have one too, right? <laughs> yes, I do. It's, it's out of frame, yeah. but it's on the wall behind me. Yeah, yeah. Mine is in frame. It's from Lacrosse. Um, so. Uh, we always end with, with with four questions. The first of which is, and if you can answer briefly, uh, is there anything we haven't asked that you'd like to have, uh, like for us to have asked um, that you can address before we before we wrap it up? Oh, you just enjoyed the conversation. And, um, I, I guess uh, just a plug again, plug for my newsletter. If, if you liked what I was talking about, that's me pouring it into type once a week and it goes out on every Friday afternoon. Okay. So the, the next is, do you have anything to say about blockchain? No. <laughs> well, no. Uh, okay. Sorry. <laughs> I, um, oh, what's the, what's the technology behind block? Oh, oh I, I think I, I see utility for blockchain. I have no utility whatsoever for crypto currency. Hmm. I, I, yeah, I see yeah, a, yeah. a fair number of applications about blockchain. I just don't see any reasonable application of cryptocurrency. I think it's, a, in my opinion, it's a great big Ponzi scam. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's a good answer. Uh, uh, and uh, the the final two is, what's your favorite text editor and scripting language? Uh, what's the one in... Um, I can't remember the... Oh, Pico is my favorite text editor. Mm-hmm. And that was uh, that was developed by the University of Washington originally for the Pine email uh, command line email system. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And the, boy, that that just is just totally intuitive to me. Um, I, I call you know the other ones I call Vile and what's the, I forget <laughs> Emacs. Yeah. I, I I could not get anything out of Emacs <laughs> ever. <laughs> Well, this is uh, this has been great, Steve. Yeah, uh, thanks. I'm, I'm 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 watching the clock, guys. I want us to have a little uh, 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 play in here. Anyway, we we have to have you back. Um, I know um, there's there's almost too much to talk about here. 
with amateur radio and and you're just a great guest so we'll there, have you there back was, there was okay, one go thing for it. I, okay so i want to put in a plug for amateur radio digital communications ardc uh, uh-huh. and that the web the web page is amper.org yeah perfect um these guys totally changed the game if you go to apply for a grant And there mm. you go. Click click on that one. Grant categories. So <laughs> these guys totally changed the game. Uh, Am- Amateur radio very briefly got a, a way back in the the prehistoric days of the early internet got a class A address allocation, sixteen million IPv4 oh. addresses, and over time it was it became obvious that we were amateur radio was never going to use. Um, even half of all those addresses. So um, there were, they made a strategic decision to sell 4 million of them to a company, which I shouldn't name. Um, but anyway, it ended up being a very large endowment and they are now parceling it out to worthy projects um, in amateur radio and other uh, affiliated fields um, we pour a heck of a lot of money into scholarships. Um, and they, I was kind of despairing for amateur radio for a long time until I heard about these guys. Um, and they are changing the game in amateur radio. They have, they're, we have allocated a lot. And I say we because I'm a volunteer member on the grants advisory committee. We don't get to say who gets grants, but we do advise the board about what we think about it as from our amateur radio backgrounds. So we've done an awful lot of good. And I, I highlighted a couple of projects that I really love that we funded. Uh, one of which was the MIT had this wonderful weather radar uh, dish on top of a 22 story building right on the MIT campus. And that building, ha- the roof on that building hadn't been maintained very well, apparently over 50 years. And so they, it finally, it came time to do it, and that that radome had to come, or that that dish had to come off the building, but it didn't. It wasn't planned to go back, and the radio club made a big stink about it and said, "Hey, if we can raise the money to pay for it, would you do it?" They said, "Oh, sure, yeah, right." So they finally came up with a budget, and it turned out the budget was 1.9 million dollars, and it just so happened that ARDC was on the scene, and they made the difference. So the total budget was 1.9 million. That's it. The the big dish is the radome in the upper right corner of that photograph. Yep, that's the one that we we helped pay for. So they raised some money on their own, and uh, ARDC uh, came through with the rest. So that radome is going to go back on that roof once the roof is finished. And it's an amazing utility. And among other things, um, Jonathan, it does moon bounce really, really well. <laughs> <laughs> I'll bet. <laughs> I'll bet. Uh, the well, o- the we other have... project. Sorry. No, I, go I, ahead. I understand go ahead. Out of time. We'll make it really quick because we've gone long. Okay. So, yeah. So, a lot of people don't know that there is an amateur radio station, actually, two of them on the International Space Station. And the astronauts give up some of the, the, the astronaut hams give up some of their free time to talk to kids at schools for over ham radio. And it's just a fantastic system. And uh, ARDC came through with a major grant for them to be able to in- continue and expand that work. So, you know, it's, as I said, ARDC is a game changer in amateur radio, and it's just making a world of difference. And they've got enough money to keep going for decades, probably. Well, that is fantastic. And I'm glad you worked those two in at the end because those are really important. And, uh, and we talked about that before I remember when you were on the phone, too. Uh, so thanks a lot, Steve. It's been great, great having you on there. I'm going to put a, we're going to have a lot of links to put in the summary, which will go online. And uh, and I hope we recruit some people. Um, it, it's, it's a fantastic way to learn about radio technology. And, you know, you don't, people think that just getting an amateur radio license means you have to talk on the air. And that's not the case at all. You can do as little or as much as you want. It's a totally, you know, very customizable um, activity. And, and Doc, please include some of those open source projects that we never got around to talking about. <laughs> <laughs> I know. 
We will. Well, we have your emails, so we can jump from uh, from them as well. So thanks again, Steve, for being on. And we'll, we'll have you back. Oh, <laughs> 73. Good, good to talk to you <laughs> kind of one-on-one, -on -one and look, great to meet you, Jonathan. Yeah, we'll, we'll talk. We'll we'll talk Starlink a lot. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> so so Jonathan, uh, we don't have much time to to banter afterwards. You do your Hackaday promo, and <laughs> but anything else you want to add uh, before we go to to post? All right, yeah, that that was a lot of fun. I'll just I'll just say that uh, I'm I'd sign up for his mailing list. Seems like uh, definitely the kind of guy I want to uh, keep in contact with. Um, yeah, so I'll, I'll mention uh, Hackaday.com. I have a security column, a few other things, but mainly the security column runs uh, every Friday morning. Uh, make sure and check that out. Uh, I, uh, I found something, and uh, because of a, a bug report in process, I can't tell you any, any more about it. But, uh, you know, within the next few weeks, hopefully, uh, there'll be a little bit of a, a original research show up on there, too. Uh, so look forward to oh, that. fantastic. Yes. Excellent. Well, well, thanks so much. Um, and actually, you're going to be back again next week. Uh, we have, I uh, want to plug uh, Janis Wiesel. Is that pronounced right? Who's going to be our guest next week? Um, that's correct. Okay. <laughs> that, 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 that sound in my, the voice in my ears says it's correct. <laughs> so so come back next week for that. And uh, until then, I'm Doc Soros. This has been Floss Weekly, and we'll see you soon. Android is constantly evolving, and if you're part of the Android faithful, then you'll be just as excited about it as I am. I'm Jason Howell, host of All About Android, along with my co-hosts Florence Ion and Ron Richards, where every week we cover the news, we cover the hardware, and we cover the apps that are driving the Android ecosystem. Plus, we invite people who are writing about Android, talking about Android, and making Android onto the show. Every Tuesday at twit.tv, look for All About Android. Thank you.